So what is going on church? I am super excited to be hanging out with you today. Why am I excited to hang out with you today? It's very simple. It is 2023. Did I get that right? Is it is it the year 2023? We have just entered into a brand new year and I know you guys are thinking like this is a brand new year. Oh my goodness, let's just get some things out of the way. Is that okay with you guys? Okay, so here's what we're gonna get out of the way. We automatically think, okay, so new year, new me, there it is. So you probably made a list or probably thought of some things that you're going to change, such as you're like, I'm going to go to the gym more. I'm going to eat better. I'm going to be better. I'm going to do X, Y, Z. And maybe you have a list of New Year's resolutions, which by the way, before you assume that I'm going to come on here and start critiquing all the New Year's resolutions, I'm not. In fact, I want to encourage you to say, hey, what if, for one, we start off the new year with an expectation, maybe, uh, or some sort of anticipation? Here are the things that I would love to accomplish within this year. But then what I want you to do is actually take that list and grow it as the year goes on. Meaning this, for example, we'll use the obvious one. Everyone wants to go and change their physical, uh, you know, way that they look throughout the year. That's That's fine. And it's a good thing. It's healthy. But so often we think, okay, that's my New Year's resolution. And then how long do New Year's resolutions last? Typically, according to science, and if I do the math right, about two weeks. That's it. That's as long as we remember how to do things. And then this is the part where, you know, you normally have a conversation. So many pastors have had this conversation. You know, if you do things for 21 days, then it becomes a habit. Ah, true and also not true. It's just a matter of what really matters to you. Ooh, yes, I went there. Um, if something actually really matters to you, then you will accomplish it. And the reason why I said take the list and run into next year, but anticipate that this list is going to grow. Part of a human being developing is that you learn systems. You learn ways of growing. So, for example, if your desire is to read a book a month, great. You then just don't worry about 12 months. Don't worry about what book is going to be read at what month and what, how fast you have to read the pages. Just Tell yourself, listen, I'm going to enjoy this book and I'm going to enjoy reading it. And I am super excited for whatever knowledge or relaxation or information I'm going to get out of it. Right. So you tell yourself, this is the book of the month. And you start to read as you read. Then when you're done, you want to jump back and reevaluate. How did I do reading that book? Did I do well? Was I focused? Do I remember what I read? Were there things that were profound or was it like a, eh, that was, you know, hurtful? Just reading the book was hurtful fine but then you can evaluate your goal and then either change it reset it or add to it in rare cases you want to get rid of it but in some cases you want to adjust that's the only reason i want to want to direct you that way why do i want to direct you that way because 2023 has in store the potential of so many different things and i say that with the with the kind of trying to to bring something to light here um so often and, and i kind of want to do this like hey can we can we pause for a second so often when we talk about the coming year and especially when you go to church what do we normally talk about when it comes to church um th there's this language that that so often is used within the the culture of church itself and it's called vision casting um the word vision casting even the phrase or that idea, the concept, is, is not found within Scripture. So I have to gently uh, say we have to be very careful that we are not placing um, things upon the church that the church was never meant to carry. Um, the church is not a business. And I say that not just to you, the listener. I want to say that to you, the listener, and maybe you want to share this with your pastor someday. Maybe you want to share it with uh, the people who are in charge of life groups within your church. Maybe you want to share it with the leadership within your church. I want you to start generating the conversation. Hey, is this a business or is this a community? Because those are two completely different things. And the reason why, and I know that I'll get some sort of, you know, rebuttal here is, I'll go, well, hold on, you know, church is a business. It was never meant to be. So if it was never meant to be, even though it has become this, is there the possibility that we can stop being that? As we're entering into 2023, I'm not sure I understand. 
as we're entering into 2023, what I am hoping will happen is, is and, and, and this is, I'm speaking to two different audiences here, and I'm, and I'm aware of that. One, I'm, I'm speaking to you, the church. I'm speaking to you who either join us online or you physically show up to our church, right, which is here in Ramona. Or maybe you're part of the online community known as the Renegade Church as well, which, again, these are two different uh, groups of people that I often teach and guide and, and, and help walk with. I want you guys to understand that as as I've reflected and as I prayerfully walk through this past year, there has been kind of this, I'm excited for what God's going to do next. And at the same time, it's the, I'm not excited for um, what does church look like? I'd rather, I said it right the first time, I'm excited for what God's going to do next. The reason why I say that is because as we have ventured through this year, looking back at it, and yes, we are looking back at the year. We, we should. We always should. We should look back at our journals. We should look back at uh, our prayer journals or maybe uh, events that we've seen, family events, um, worldwide events. We want to look at where in the world have we come from so that we can know where we're going. As we reflected upon this year, we went through the book of Revelation. We have uh, taken the slow walk up to Advent and looking at the birth of Christ. We have celebrated Easter, and even we were anticipating what does Easter really mean? Uh, not only salvation for our souls, but what does that really mean? What is going on with our souls that we need Jesus to repair, to renew, and reform? And in that process, I find myself, and I say this, and it's, it's a good and a bad, I find myself kind of having too many conversations with folks like you that are asking questions that that there are answers to, but oftentimes um, the questions that are being presented are as a result of, of someone in your life or somewhere in your life, or maybe you're currently in the stage where you're, you have been following Jesus in word, but when it comes down to like the nitty gritty, the, it, and even I would even go so far as to say the, the hard parts of life, it, it, we're struggling, we're, we're stumbling, we're, we're kind of getting through the thing uh, without really knowing what the thing is, let alone what the goal is on the other side. And it's really this kind of ambiguous this ambiguous kind of feel of like, what am I doing? What is my faith? What is Christianity? What, where is this going? That, does that make sense? And I kind of want to land this plane on a subject that it's, I know this is going to sound really weird guys, but it's a subject that not many churches nowadays. And I say this specifically only of the Western church. No one is talking about discipleship. Now, I, I, I'll clarify this. Maybe you're like, no, no, no. My church does talk about discipleship. It, it maybe talks about discipleship, meaning we would like to generate more small groups or life groups, or uh, we want people to start gathering together. But to clarify what the goal in that is, and I'm not saying every person has this goal. I'm just saying that 99.9% .9 have this goal. And that is if we can get people to gather together then more people will gather together which ends up bringing us to this thing called metrics which is how do we as a church successfully uh measure our success now you may be wondering johnny what are you talking about i feel like you're talking in circles i am and the reason why i'm talking in circles because i want you to bring you bring you through this whole circle do you remember I started off saying church is not a business? The reason why I have to clarify that church is not a business is because if we treat church as a business, as if we view church as a business, then we will incorporate business mentality and business language into her vernacular. In other words, churches will say things like cast vision. You can cast vision in a company that sells motorcycles, cars, you can cast vision into a company that sells like, um, you know, 
computer, electronics, I mean, tablets. You can cast vision into a nursery and how you're going to sell trees. Like all of that is well and good because it's business. The church, not a business. When I say that, then that automatically removes the concepts of business. It's the year 2023 and every pastor should at this moment in time cast vision meaning meaning how much money are we going to spend and what are we going to spend it on if we're going to be truthful it's more what does the pastor want to spend money on and how much money do they want to gain Churches are not called to cast vision because the vision has already been created. Well, Pastor Johnny, what's your mission? It's called read the last chapter of the Gospels, specifically Matthew. Go into the world and make disciples. See there, do you, do you guys see where these, these issues are going to start to conflict? Because we're using language that we have no knowledge of. Meaning, let me ask you this, just... Why not? When I use the word disciple, describe to me what a disciple means. Now, for some of you who probably threw out the answer, it means somebody's following Jesus. Great. What do you actually mean by that? In fact, I would venture so much to say is that when we say, how do we make disciples? The brain and or the room gets real fuzzy. And it gets real fuzzy because we're like, well, I make disciples. So, yeah. Um, and then we automatically think of a program. We have uh, kids programs and youth programs and young adult programs and young married programs. And we have, you know, a middle, middle of life programs. And then we have, oh, yeah, we have a seniors group. We have a women's group. We have a men's group. We have a no. All you're doing is categorizing people. That's not discipleship. That's just the ability of, for you to categorize. That doesn't do anything. Do you see where I'm going with this? As I'm walking into 2023 on a personal level, it's the, okay, Jesus, what have I assumed in my relationship with you that is completely wrong, completely off base? Like there is terrible theology in it. How Can you help me recognize that personally? I'm not talking about the church. I'm not talking about any corporation. I'm not talking about any business. Jesus, what am I doing that's not of you, of you? What have I done wrong? Or what am I thinking wrong? That's not actually your thoughts. Like, it, do I have a view of you that's not actually you? Great. Wonderful. Let's start there. And that cannot happen unless it's personal. Okay, now that we've understood the uh, my misunderstandings and my misconceptions of, of, of God, and we're going to work on that, and who knows how long that'll take. But then it's the, okay, now that I'm starting to get to know God more personally, by the way, can I make this clear? Not by hearsay. I, I want to drive that home more than anything because that's been the experience that I am I am really encountering this entire last year. So 2022 was the, what if my faith is all based on hearsay? Meaning, I have heard stories of stories of stories or pastors who have taught about, well, one time I heard, one time I heard, one time I heard. But no one is actually saying whether those stories are true. So am I living a faith that is hearsay? What if my faith was actually meant to be personal before anything else? Meaning, God is interested in interacting with me on a one-on-one -on -one basis through not just the holy moments or the sacred moments known as church or church-related events, which don't make any sense anyway. But what if God is trying to interact with me on a personal level? Meaning, that when I'm sitting with my sons, he's interested in being present with me and helping me be present and a father. And even those two come secondary to first being loved by him and being a disciple. He's interested in, in being present with me when I'm having dialogue with my wife or for all I know, argument. Which, by the way, yeah, pastors argue especially with their spouses, because their spouses are normally smarter than they are. 
And there's no shame in that, by the way. What if Jesus is trying to be present with me in my daily life? Which means that there is no longer just sacred moments referring to church or church-related events. Life that has been handed to me is sacred. Because Jesus is interested in being present and working his glory through all of it. What if, and I just had this conversation with someone, what if my faith in him is not a tool to get things done. In other words, if I have enough faith, then I will see X, Y, Z happen, which is normally what vision casting is. Here's what we want to do. Here's what here's what God has told us to do. And now it's the, you know, here's a million dollars that we need to fundraise because we're going to build a brand new facility and God's going to fill it with people. And, and yeah, God didn't say any of that, but good job. No. As God is revealing himself, I am getting to know God more in the intimate moments of everyday life. As I get to know him more, I am agreeing with him that he has revealed himself to me and that what he is stating about himself is true. As I get to know him more, then my faith increases. But it doesn't, faith is not here so that I can get stuff done. Faith is here so that I can get to know God more. See what I mean? When you think of church, what do you think of? And 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 if we're going to be honest with one another, and I know this seems like, are we ever going to get to the scriptures? You know what? That's actually another issue for a whole other day that we can talk to. Yes, we will get the scripture, of course. But it's that when we think of church, what do we think of? Okay, so I show up to a facility with people that I know Maybe not all of them, but I know, uh, or mean none of them, but I show up to a facility and there's normally some sort of uh, music or bump in music going on already. I, I, I walk in, right? And then there's the worship and the worship is either extravagant and a show or it is dumbed down to the point where I can hear a pin drop in the room. And by the way, quietness doesn't always mean reverence. It, it can just be quiet and dull. And, and, and there's this, there's this, and then, you know, there's somebody who shares like, hey, here's what's going on. We would love for you to participate and, and so on and so forth. And, and, and if you, if you, you know, do X, Y, Z, then we'll do X, Y, Z. And, and we would love to get to know you. And what they really mean is put your information down so we can add you to the roster. Not that they actually want to get to know you. That's just disappointing, dumb and wrong. And then there's this. Okay, transition, prayer, song, prayer, song, prayer is used as a transition. And I know a lot of this, you're sitting there going, Pastor Johnny, you seem very frustrated, and angry. And no, frustrated and angry is not there. It, it, it's the, I, I don't want to live in pretend world anymore. Especially with the culture that we're living in right now. Like this whole, I make up stories and identify the way. Oh, okay. No, no, no. No more pretend. No more playing the game this is why we're getting to what we're getting to <laughs> and then there's some sort of sermon and the sermon is either copied from another guy's sermon online or somebody watched a youtube video and they got super excited over it so now they want to share with the congregation nobody seems to want to sit at the feet of jesus with their bible open nobody has learned and i say that generically i don't mean it in a hurtful way Nobody has been taught how to understand scripture within its context. Nobody has been taught how to read Greek or Hebrew. Nobody has been taught on um, looking at the timeline of, of what is happening in history at the same time that this letter is written. Nobody has been taught uh, who is speaking, who's writing, what you're reading, um, and who are they writing to, and what was the purpose of them writing to them, what was the goal that God had in mind. I mean, God obviously wanted something being said, otherwise he wouldn't have said it, otherwise it wouldn't have been written. So on and on and on the list goes. Instead, what we've got is these poppy, cool, um, you know, probably one-liners of scripture and everything else as a pastor's opinion for the goal of you making making you feel better and them feel better and everyone feels better and they'll come back next week to find out how to feel even better than they were this week and then they go and everyone argues and gets in a fight in the car as they're leaving the parking lot and we'll see you guys at some other bible study something's missing 
And as I'm looking at 2023, what I'm encouraging you, both audiences, both, uh, you know, the church here in Ramona and also the church online and the renegade movement, I want everyone to understand we're looking at the next year. It's the I, I don't want to set up any goals. I want to organically see God do what God wants to do. But it doesn't mean we're walking into it with no plans. It's it's the it's the I I don't want to walk in with some sort of tangibles and walk into this idea of metrics and we are going to, you know, measure successes. Can we just look at scripture and allow God to be God and allow scripture for to speak to the community that it has created and tell us our why so that when we walk into 2023, we know why we're here. We know who we're here for and whose we belong to and what he wants to do in the future. That being said, I want you to turn your attention, since we've been spending time with the doctor, turn to the book of Acts, also written by Luke, also written for the purpose of handing it to Theophilus. And he, and he starts off obviously telling, telling us the birth of the church. We're not going to go into depth yet. We will eventually. But we, what I want to highlight to you is something very unique. And a lot of assumptions that we have put into this text that we are going to scatter out of the way and say, no, let's just read it for what it is. And it says this according to um, Acts chapter 2, verse 41. So those who accepted his message were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 people were added to their number. Um, th this is where pastors go baz bazonkers. Like, yeah, you know, that's what we need is thousands upon thousands upon thousands. Numbers do not matter in the way that they are treated today. Meaning, people matter. They are not numbers. They are people with stories. They are people with souls. The number is significant. Why? Because according to Exodus 32, I might be wrong, but I believe it's Exodus 32, 22. Moses walks down from the mountain and God has told him already they're worshiping a false god that looks like a golden cow. As Moses comes down, he gets angry. He lets his anger take over the situation so badly that he drops the Ten Commandments, shattering both tablets. Then he tells his servant, you know, the guys that were near, hey, come here. And he, I, I forget who it is that he tells, I think it was Levi, but he tells him, hey, I want you to grab your sword and your men. And go through the camp. And whoever worshipped the false god, the golden calf, killed them. You talk about a butchering situation. Do you, I want you to turn there. Not right now, but when you have time. You can pause the video. Go check it out. How many people died on that day? 3,000. Israel's promise by God is that there would be a Messiah. There would be a Mashiach, and that Mashiach would bring a Messianic age. And the Messianic age would have the Holy Spirit living inside of the believers. And that that Messianic age would open the door, not just to Israel, but to the rest of the world. As we read the book of Acts, that exact thing happens. And as a result, 3,000 people come to faith. There was about 180 to 200,000 people in, in the population. So 3,000 people really isn't that big of a number. However, it is significant in that in Exodus, 3,000 people were lost as a result of sin and breaking the law. And because of Jesus, 3,000 people have been found. The number is not significant. It's rather the redemption that is happening. What does the church look like in its infancy? This is where Luke, by the way, he doesn't paint the church in a pretty color all the time. No, but he's saying, look, listen, at, when this thing started, look at what God was doing. Look at what God was doing organically. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship. By the way, that's koinonia. To the breaking of bread and to prayer. Is this, is it, what do we assume? This is church, right? People gathering. This is church. No, no, no. That's the first misconception. 
Nowhere in this text does it say they're gathering. Nowhere in this text does it say that this is what they did when they gathered. What Luke is telling us is here are the following things that stood out. And by the way, sometimes they would do this when they would gather. Sometimes they would do this in their homes. Sometimes they would do this in the public areas like parks and hanging out spots and the, and the portico. Like this is, he's just highlighting something. And what do they do? This, they devoted themselves. They dedicated themselves to saying, hey, what are the apostles teaching us? What did Jesus teach them? By the way, this is actual discipleship. Teaching someone the things that Jesus taught them. The apostles were teaching them what Jesus had taught them, and they were listening and applying what the apostles were teaching them to what they were doing in their daily lives. And where did that take place? It took place in homes, in gatherings, in, in public areas. In other words, life. They dedicated their time to fellowship, meaning, folks, you cannot, and I'm saying this as lovingly as I can, you cannot watch this video and count it as church. You can't. And I'll prove to you how. Jesus didn't show up through a screen. God showed up in person. Because he knew that the only way we could have a relationship with him is if he showed up in person. So if you are going to give me the excuse of, I don't like churches, they're a bunch of this, they're a bunch of that, and you would rather stay home in the comfort of your home and just watch a video? No, sir. No, ma'am. No, no. This isn't church. Church is showing up. And by the way, I'm also not telling you where to go to church. That's not the goal either. Show up to the community of faith. And the first one is your family. We won't even show up to them sometimes. They dedicated themselves to showing up, to fellowship, koinonia, to the breaking of bread. They got together to eat. Why? Do you not understand the amount of intimacy there is at the table? Do we even sit at the table anymore? I mean, we just sit in front of screens all the time. Kids can't function unless there's a screen in front of them. They don't know what to say at a table. This this interaction, eyeball to eyeball and, and eating, which is honestly an act of intimacy. Like you're watching someone scarf things down. That's a big deal. And the last thing, which is normally the last thing we do. Prayer. In the infancy of the church, they said, we are going to dedicate our time and our energy to learning the things that Jesus taught us through the people that Jesus gave us. But learning those experiences ourselves personally. And then we are going to share in having meals together and meeting at each other's houses together because that's what family does. Helping each other in whatever needs we may have between one another. And then on top of that, we are a community of prayer. Why? Because we are seeking the one who has redeemed us. And not to get things done. Not to, hey, God, I need X, Y, Z. No, it's the, hey, these are the needs that we have, but we also want to pray for the needs of others. And we want you, Jesus, to show up in these different places and homes. We want you to expand your kingdom. We are given the privilege, the privilege of expanding the kingdom of God. We can't keep doing this whole, yeah, I'll pray for you, and then never pray for the person. Are you kidding me? That's so offensive. Our goal has always been to bring the kingdom. Everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and signs were being performed through the apostles. Why were signs and wonders performed? Because God wanted to show them, I am in your midst. And when I step in, there are no rules. I make up the rules. I change the rules. I can do miracles. I can change the fabric of reality. Why? Because heaven is more real than this world that we're living in. The miracles are not the goal. The miracles are the byproduct and the goal is God. The fellowship of believers and sharing and the things that what God is doing. They sold their possessions. Sorry, verse 44. Now all the believers were together and held all things in common. 
there was a new community being established where nobody was alone. Everyone knew like this person, even though I don't know them from Adam, they've got my back. They have my best interest in, in mind. They know how to love me and I know how to love them and I have their best interest. Like there's, there's this common understanding. God has redeemed us all. God is restoring us. But come on. And it just keeps going. Now all the believers were together and held all things in common. They sold their possessions and property and distributed the proceeds to all who had any need. Every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple and broke bread from house to house. Are you are you talking about house churches? Yes. Yes. Like, hey, come over. I want to share my dinner. I, I have more than enough. Like, come over. We're going to have dinner together. And then afterward, we're going to talk. Hey, what's God doing in your life? What's God doing in my life? Like, can we share... Do you realize that Sunday is 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 the climax of, of our having a relationship with God and sharing with one another? Now we finally get together together and sing the song that's been bubbling up all week long. But instead, we have completely turned church into something that's not supposed to. And we say, okay, I go there to get goods by giving of, of what I have. In other words, it's a financial transaction. I pay my tithe and you give me what I'm anticipating and expecting, which is some sort of spiritual meal. And then somehow I'm supposed to starve myself the rest of the week and then show up for next week. And by the way, if I don't like the meal that you're giving me, then I won't give you the money and I'll go give my money to the next meal. Do you see where... Ooh, if this whole thing is offensive, it probably should be. But it's only offensive if this is a way you've treated church. If this is how you've treated discipleship, if this is your concept of Christianity. Every day they devoted themselves to meeting one another. Meeting was important. Where? In the temples. That's out in public. They broke bread from house to house. They had meals. They shared with one another. They ate their food with joyful and sincere hearts. Do you realize that this, this description is, is the, the, the anticipation that Israel had within the Messianic age? There will be a utopian community that will love will be the signature of everything that they do because god is with them and god is renewing them and restoring them oh my goodness can i get an amen is that what we see today no in fact none of this language is the language that we use to define what church is today Praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. That's a weird way of saying it because it sounds like everyone was happy with them. Yeah, people were happy with them because even the people that weren't part of Israel. By the way, the church never separated itself from Israel. And by the way, it never should have. In fact, we are living out the messianic age that they were anticipating, meaning that our roots and our culture should be tied to Judaism. True or not true? It's true. As they were sharing this, as they were having, uh, you know, having the favor of people, yes, people were going, I've never seen such a loving community, a selfless community. And they want it in. By the way, that's what should naturally happen. If you think that it's your pastor's job to get people saved, in other words, you have a neighbor and you're like, I got to get my neighbor to church so they can meet my pastor and then my pastor will get them saved. Well, son of a hamster, you have this thing upside down and backwards. <laughs> your neighbor your the, you have the kingdom of god in your hand it is your job to invite them over to dinner to your house to share with them what god has done in your life and that is what brings them the faith if it was the pastor's job we're already outnumbered it's everyone's job my job as a pastor this is going to sound weird we often think of pastors as generals right like i'm the i'm the <laughs> No, we're not generals. You know what we are? If I could describe to you in the language of World War II, there were trenches where soldiers were constantly popping their heads up and shooting at the enemy. There was a guy always running around making sure everyone had water and bullets. That was his job. That, my dear friends, is the job of a pastor. To run around making sure everyone has all the supplies that they need. And in the process taking care of themselves. We need to be taken care of too. 
That's why there are spiritual giants out there that help us, guide us. We're lacking something, and it is depth. Every day the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Do we see that every day? No. Why? Because whatever we think we are doing and we call it church today is nothing close to what it should be. The church in the book of Acts was organically growing. And please understand when I use the word growing, I'm not talking about numbers. I am saying they were experiencing God one-on-one, -on -one, not hearsay, not some sermon, not something I heard, not a book that I read. No, it was we were experiencing the 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 dwelling of the Holy Spirit, the the prophetic uh, you know utterance that God was giving, uh, the 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 revelation of Jesus as Lord, and at the same time viewing that all of these promises that were given thousands of years back were being fulfilled in this community and that this community was created for by in through and only in christ and that they sensed a love that could not compare to any love that any human being could ever give you no this is a love that was agape love from god from jesus himself and the holy spirit was constantly stirring that love so it almost felt like Every day you wake up, you feel like you're falling in love again. And that love had to express itself. It, it could not be bottled. And what were they doing? They would gather together for the purpose of worshiping God. Do we have worship in churches? Sure. I'm not going to say that we have the worship of God. Because we can have musical interludes and never connect with God. This, folks, is why I want to prepare you for 2023. Because for 2023, what I sense, and what I, especially with the way that this world and the direction that it's going, at the same time, the questions that I'm being asked and why these people are not finding answers is as a result of nobody discipling them because nobody knows how to make disciples. In 2023, I would love, by God's grace, by his power, by his empowerment, show you what it means to actually be a disciple and actually interact with God personally. Meaning, if you don't do the work, I'm not going to make anything happen. That's never meant to be that way. In fact, I'm going to give you the tools, but your hands are going to have to be the greasy ones that go in and going, okay, God, let's go, let's try. And there is going to be so much trial and error and failure and praise God, because that is going to have you interacting with God face to face. And you're finally going to learn the basics of, I was called to pray. I was called to worship. I was called to study God's word. I was called to be formed into the image of Jesus. I was called to entrust myself, my agenda, my will, and my desire to the hands of the Holy Spirit. I was never called to be anxious, but to be peaceful. I was called to be a temporary resident like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in a land that I am not going to be here forever. But while I'm here, heaven will find a home. What if we did this? Dropping anxiety, fear, power, wealth, fame what if we just drop these things and said okay wait what 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 if what if we read what we just read and we we saw that happen what do you think that would look like how do you think that would feel 2023 the year that god showed up what's next Grace and peace be with you. Oh yeah, this is the way. I'll see you guys next Sunday.